so the more that I care about art because it pertains to life itself, which is more important than the art, there's a real casual way in which I can go about it at this point, you know? I mean, like I have deep feeling toward it, but at the same time, like it is just a painting. Like I don't ever like worry that something is is going wrong or something. And so the hand, like with the surface of the, of the piece, it's really pretty non-analytical most of the time making a piece, you know, like one mark is just as good as another. One color is just as good as another, at least until, you know, later you come back and you, and you can see it in a certain way and you think, well, okay, maybe I'll go this way now, you know, just that overall realization though, that like the more that life itself matters and the less that all the other abstract concerns matter, the more the work matters, but only because in these spaces you can say it doesn't matter. (laughs) It's like this imbrication of meaning and non-meaning of mattering and not mattering. Hey everyone. Welcome to the podcast. This is your host, Yoshino. You are listening to another episode of Artist Decoded. This is my podcast interview with my friend, artist and painter, Joshua Hagler. Josh has been a longtime guest of this podcast. We first had him and his wife, Maya, on back in 2016. It's truly been a privilege to see both of them grow, but more specifically, since we're talking about Josh today, it's been truly a pleasure to watch him transform over these past few years. And I really enjoyed sharing a creative dialogue with Josh and catching up with him in general. And prior to this recorded conversation, we had an over an hour catch up just talking about our lives, various books that we've been reading, how things have changed over the years. And a lot of our conversation had to do with the overlaps of spirituality, connection, meditation, and life as a whole. And when I talked to him the other day, I knew I was talking to a much wiser, more thoughtful version of Josh. I felt so inspired to riff with him about the beauty and subtle things, the beauty of simply existing. And his energy now is just so magnetic and he's very considerate and I also admire his willingness to come onto the podcast to share an open vulnerable and explorative dialogue and in this episode we spoke about his move from California to New Mexico in 2017 and about his most recent project Nihil and how his change in perspective over time has led to the birth of this project. There's a lot of nuance in this conversation, which if you are all fans of the arts, which I'm assuming that's why you're here, I think you'll really appreciate that about this conversation. And if you've never seen Josh's work before, please do me a favor and go check it out at joshuahagler.com. And if you like his work, which I'm sure you will, You can find out more about his work at his website, and you can also read all of the tenets of Nihil. And Josh's perspective, I truly admire, especially his writing in those tenets, because the way that he describes things is he allows room for exploration. He doesn't paint things black and white. He enjoys this idea that I've been enjoying recently of the paradox within things, how things can be perceived maybe in the past as good and bad, good or bad. Uh, There's more subtlety in that conversation. And he really inspires a conversation to be had around the arts and life. I'm just going to leave it at that because I think that you should go check it out. But that's joshuahagler.com. Or you can find him on Instagram at Hagler Josh. So before we begin, please go to our iTunes page and Spotify page to leave us a review. It'll only take you a couple seconds to leave us a review, and that I would greatly appreciate. 
Also, we recently set up a donate page on our website, artistdakota.com. Now, let me remind you that this is an independently run and funded podcast, so any little bit helps, and I would also greatly appreciate that as well. So here it is. Without further ado, my conversation with artist Joshua Hagler. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate it, man. Pleasure is mine, Yoshino. It really means a lot to be invited back a couple of times like we've done. So thank you. Of course, you're always invited back. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'll just come knocking on the door. So I've got something new to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, you have any time in your schedule? Yeah, yeah. You can you can do that whenever you want. <laughs> All right. Good I'll deal. I'll leave that uh, open door policy for you. Uh, strictly for you. Um, yeah, so... Prior to our conversation today, I asked you to recite one of the tenets of Nihil from your project, and I was wondering which one you chose. Yeah, I think um, exile and absence is probably the way to go. And then each one of these is subtitled. So the, the subtitle of exile and absence is the archaic brother. Cool. It may be uh, useful to explain too that there's there's nine of these nine of these tenets Mm -hmm. for the for the project i'm working on called nihil which will take me over the next few years i think two to three years and um so what it really is 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 just sort of an imposed structure that um i'm sort of using instead of concept you could say so structure instead of concept i've worked conceptually and Mm. And and in that way for many years and I've had reason to believe that, uh, that that's limited. So, uh, I've, I've started this. And so it's sort of really just like creating like a dogma, the the rules themselves, they're almost arbitrary and they're not even really rules. They're just sort of principles that, um, I thought about and eventually could kind of break it up into nine different ones, which kind of govern, um, basically the ethos and the thinking behind how the work is made. Yeah. Yeah. And can, can I make a comment too that, you know, it's interesting, maybe perhaps the word dogma to me, uh, has a certain weight to it, especially in like a religious context. But I think like what I enjoyed about reading your tenants is that they're very paradoxical in a lot of ways. And it's also opened up to a lot of various explorations but it does show a certain philosophy regarded around principles based on your experiences and observations. And I think it, at least for me, it made me understand you and your motivations and just you as a person and like how you kind of also state that it's like an exploration. You, you, you're not saying like, this is specifically the conclusion that I'm coming to. It's more of like an open-ended conversation, if you will. Does that make sense? It does totally. And that's actually a lot of the point. The word paradox is really it, you know, Uh, there's a paradox just in imposing a structure so that the structure itself allows really anything to meander through. And I um, like that. Because you're you're starting with a certain set of assumptions, but you're not starting with uh, a conclusion, which is somewhat different. It means that as the work is made, or as I'm going about this within this particular structure, that it's opening up in the process to me so that my mind changes as I'm working, the way that I think about questions and issues we might all think about when we're making art changes through the process. Yeah. So. It's uh, it actually becomes very open ended by starting with a pretty um, a pretty a fixed structure. Mm-hmm. Yes. So anyway, the 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 first of them of the nine mm-hmm. is exile and absence, and that's a uh, the for the work to be the work of Nihil, it needs to come from this place of exile. 
that's um, yeah. one of its uh, primary underpinnings. Mm-hmm. So I can uh, I can read it. Okay. Okay. Um, in nihil, exile is the necessary precondition for beginning the work. Exile is the consequence of being outside the social order of things. This failure to belong results from a refusal to communicate deferentially to the implicit or explicit expectations and requirements of the social group. The language might well develop and deepen over time, but it doesn't mean the social order perceives a need for it. The language of consensus is the language of obviousness. In Nihil, it's understood that nothing obvious is worth saying, but only obviousness can be widely discussed. In the social order, it's the discussion and the game of discussion that matters more than the work. In Nihil, however, and in exile that ensues, it's precisely the opposite. Exile begins at the point in which I give up hope of belonging or communicating. What for a while, on the far side of hope, is an experience of alienation, eventually makes real freedom possible. Freedom begins with the embrace of emptiness, which is also vastness. It is possible in Nihil by developing a relationship with place, in my case, New Mexico, and shifting communication from a primarily social or public concern in the present to an intimate individual concern over a course of time extending beyond my own life. Concepts such as relevance no longer seem relevant to me. Once the impossibility of joining is finally accepted, I discover I was in exile all along. Most of us resist becoming aware of the falseness of belonging for as long as the situation allows, but the unavoidable stage of angst and heartbreak we attempt to avoid is only momentary in the scheme of things, so long as we prefer the experience of being with over the meaning of the story about. Exile is the beginning of freedom that follows from this loss of hope. To do the work of Nihil, the work must not seek to matter. It must become free. In practice, exile means a few things. I must leave the densely populated metropolis for the sparsely populated landscape. This landscape must begin as a stranger because all discoveries ought to be made with no greater sophistication than a child discovers the world beyond the home of her parents for the first time. I must not know where I am or be allowed to return to where I was. In time, place reveals itself as myself, both alien and familiar. All my life, I've awaited my arrival here without knowing. Exile transubstantiates into repatriation. The soul remembers the soul, arriving at last at Axis Mundi. In exile, the eye is trained to notice absence as the most potent presence in the visual field. Absence is home to the archaic brother and the source of it. After all, the first stage of exile began when I was a young boy, when my brother suddenly vanished. His trace was to be found everywhere and nowhere. This vanishing happened not once, but rather is always happening to the memory, the body, the painting. As he vanishes to the outside world, little by little, year after year, he appears in the forgotten places of New Mexico. This is where the archaic brother is to be found, in the negative space between junipers, in the floors and ceilings of abandoned churches and schools, in the middle distance from where I sit to where the fires in the mountains rage. The archaic brother is the very archetype of absence. All matters of absence pertain to the archaic brother, and only out of absence can he be present. The presence felt in painting, for example, is to do with absence, with the epistolary substance between my exile and his. So that's it. Each each one of these is about about that length. Yeah. Yeah, I really liked reading these. You're a very good writer. Thanks, Yoshino. I appreciate that. I had always wanted to be a writer as much as an artist, but, uh, I don't know by the, the accident of time, Mm. just focused more on visual art, I suppose. (laughs) I like that. The accident of time. (laughs) 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 I love that. I I mean, yeah, I could see you writing some sort of novel or, uh, something of that, like a, a long, longer length, um, book of some sort at some point, I don't know, just the way that you, your perspective and your philosophies, I think are really intriguing for me. Like I read, 
exile and absence a couple of times just to, because the way that you also structure things, or maybe it's not the structure, but it's more so about like, there's a lot of, it's very dense and there's a lot of meaning and intention behind each sentence. And I appreciated that. For instance, the language of consensus is the language of obviousness. In Nihil, it's understood that nothing obvious is worth saying, but only obviousness can be widely discussed. And like, I, I, I mean, like it, it makes sense, but I also kind of like laughed a bit too, because it, it's true. <laughs> like, I think that um, based on our social conditionings, we're told to look at, I mean, even if we're just speaking specifically about art, we're, we're told to look at art a certain way and certain things are like um, relevant or certain things are um, topical. And I mean, you even in, in one, of, I, don't, I don't know which one it was, which one of the tenants, but you talk about that in terms of like cultural references or maybe it's a non-mediation, I forget, but oh, uh-huh. you speak about like, um, I forget exactly what, what you said in there, but I'm just thinking in terms of um, this specifically, like the language of consensus is the language of obviousness. It's like, what is a culturally appropriate thing to say? Or what is like something that is a relevant topic to discuss, you know? So it just kind of made mm-hmm. me uh, further uh, go into my own introspection on these sort of ish- topics, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, I didn't come to these ideas and um, (laughs) a sort of analytical way, really. I mean, the stuff is very personal to me and it's it's not, um, it's come out of what, of what space still seems available in which to dwell. Mm. you know and i mean just in living life itself but in making the work as well you know yeah yeah and y- you know you you may go through uh you know like in my case i mean i was i lived in california for 15 years in san francisco and la and uh and all that time i never felt any closer to ever kind of belonging to any of the you know the art clicks or anything like that you know mm. And uh, it wasn't for lack of trying. It wasn't a, a resistance on my part or a, a rejection on my part. You know, it mm-hmm. was just an inability to feel that it was possible to belong somewhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, that's that's difficult for people. People want to belong, and so uh, you know, how do you deal with that? So I mean, that a lot of this has come out of dealing with that, and uh, and and I have been you know, working through that and thinking through that for many years and to the, to be able to come to a place where you feel actually set free by that as opposed to either like heartbroken or resentful or anything like that, you know, all that stuff actually kind of keeps you prisoner to the same kind of hope or expectation of being accepted. Hmm. Yeah. And so speaking of you leaving California and moving to New Mexico, what were the decisions that came along the way that made you want to move out to New Mexico? Well, it was really, um, the one option that was open to us. Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, we were totally broke in LA, but that was 2017. Yeah. Um, and we, we literally came to a place where we could not pay next month's rent for the studio. Yeah. And, and, uh, it was also when I learned that I was accepted for the Roswell artists in residence program, which was just a shock, you know? Um, but we, we had tried to send out some applications. I don't know, you know, some months before half a year before or whenever. Uh, as contingency plans, you know, because we realized we were just going to keep running out of money. Mm. And, um, and that, that was the one (laughs) that I was accepted to, you know, of the ones I applied to. So, and it just happened to be kind of the best one in a sense that, you know, it provided a a year 
uh, for us to work, uh, provided a house and uh, a studio for both of us, for my and me, um, a monthly stipend and uh, a little materials grant. And um, so it was the one place that we could go to keep working. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting how, I don't know if there's really an explanation for it, but it's just interesting how, like, how things work out in that way, right? Because otherwise you probably wouldn't have went to New Mexico. Never. No. And <laughs> right, right. I mean, but this is, the, isn't this the way that life always continues to unfold and reveal itself? You know, mm, I mean, if reveal you feel itself, I like that. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, for sure. I mean, like, and, and it was funny because when we got to Roswell, we were, you know, we didn't, I think like our, I general idea was, okay, well, we'll be here and we'll work for a year and we'll save money because we won't be spending any. And, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully things get a little bit better for our careers or something like this. And, um, but I mean, we weren't expecting that either, actually, you know, I mean, I, when you, when you live in a, when you live in a city like LA or New York or something like that, you think that if you ever leave that place, it's impossible. Like life ends. <laughs> you know? There like, is, there like is no, no life <laughs> beyond uh, metropolis cities. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, any kind of expectation or kind of common knowledge you could have had about that was all wrong. All of it was wrong, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we, we were in Roswell for like only like two or three months. And we're, I just remember turning to each other and each of us sort of checking in and being like, wait a minute, like, do you actually like it here? Because th there's not anything really particular about Roswell that I, I think like a lot of people would, uproot themselves and move to I'm sorry for anyone from Roswell listening to this, you know, but, yeah. but, it, but it's kind of the truth, you know, and, um, and, yeah. and, uh, but we turned to each other and we're like, yes, we were just so relieved, you know, and, and so grateful to the residency and the foundation and all this. I mean, it, it has a community. We were having a great time. And, you know, in that time we got to explore like lots of parts of New Mexico, so the state in general was something we fell in love with really quickly. And the, and the thing about people who discover that about New Mexico, like, you know, all of us who live here or whatever, like we all kind of like share this understanding that it's sort of a secret mm. and, and we're really glad that it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, cause the cost of living and, out there isn't that expensive too. Right. In most places. Right. I mean, you know, yeah, maybe if you could talk all about New Mexico, but like Santa Fe is expensive. Yeah, the, but other than that, right, it's much cheaper than uh, than, than LA. You know, LA, sure, or really anywhere in California. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And then, so when you moved out there for the residency, at what point? So I'm kind of retracing our steps back from when I had you on the podcast last. So, mm -hmm. uh. I'm curious because so in 2019, so you moved out there in 2017 and then 2019 you had Chimera, the show, your show Chimera. And that's when you came on the yeah. podcast last. Yeah. And so I'm curious like how things have changed for you since you were last on the podcast from that show. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to remember what all I, what all we, we're talking about at that time, but yeah, I, I, I don't remember. You know, I don't remember at all. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I don't right. remember at all. But um, well, um, you know that show Chimera. I remember, you know, I was making work um, about things and in a certain mindset where you know the whole kind of um, the the political stage was seeming really goofy and overly simple and annoying to me at that time mm -hmm. already, you know? Uh, and that's, you know, that, that was why I called it chimera really was, you know, chimera being this beast that, you know, is made of three different parts in Greek mythology, but I was looking at the culture that way. And the fact that it's popular meaning is to do with something which is illusory or out of reach. And, yeah. um, so I was looking at the way in which, uh, I don't want to go over all of it again, but it was just that yeah. things are politically a lot more complicated than it than could be discussed publicly, certainly in the art world, but like in any kind of subculture, you mm -hmm. know? And, um, 
and then I, I think after that, I mean, like that show was like, I was proud of that work and it did well and everything like that. You know, I mean, life and, and work and everything had really turned around by then. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I was working with unit and they were doing a great job and we still work together and it's great. Um, but I, I kind of learned the same thing that I learned over and over again, which is like, you know, all these kind of subtleties that are in the work, like they're, they're all going to be missed. Like there's no review or inner, like none of this stuff is ever really going to get talked about or understood just like everything else before it, you know? Mm -hmm. And even, um, well, so there was a problem with my strategies and in terms of how I was thinking about making work, like I wanted to be able to discuss these things, but there's just no place for it, you Mm -hmm. know? And, um, and that, that was the last show that I made that made any attempt to talk about things in any kind of political or historical sense or anything like that. And Hmm. so there's the troubling part of that, which is like, you know, the questions you're asking yourself as an artist, like, am I, am I failing? Does my work fail? All that kind of stuff you have to get through. Um, Wait, uh, let let me, let me ask you something real quick. So like, in yeah. terms of failing, like what would a failure look like to you in terms of like, as it's regarded in, to you and your work? Yeah. So the failure I'm talking about has nothing to do with like a uh, commercial stuff or, you know, that, I mean, that, that show sold really well, you know, mm. it didn't, it wasn't like, um, like in, for all intents and purposes, like everything that I was doing by then was succeeding a lot more than stuff I had been doing before. But what I mean about failure is mm-hmm. about the way one might try to push a conversation that just isn't wanted or being had mm. and there's nowhere to have it. And in in my case, I think like if you see one of my paintings, it feels so much about painting, you know. You're looking at the marks, you're looking at the, the the physicality of it and all this stuff. And if I want to be really cerebral and talk about things and sort of these other terms, that's actually working sort of counter to the painting. Like, you know, one is sort of going to be the prisoner of the other. Either you're, you're you know, you're, you're, the painting itself is sort of a trapped by and is a prisoner to these ideas or, you know, mm-hmm. the ideas are sort of like stuck in the painting or imprisoned by the painting, you know, and, you know, you kind of can't have both really. I mean, if, Mm. if the sort of sensuousness of the work is important to you, you kind of can't have both. And, um, so the, the good thing about all of that is that in the end I was set free by it, you know, Mm. like there's, there's not like, I'm not working anymore with like the idea that, there's something to be understood or that, you know, what I'm quote saying needs to be understood or that it, that it, it fits inside some kind of like um, quasi art historical arc that, you know, Mm -hmm. can be put in the, in the press release and, (laughs) you know, give somebody a, (laughs) you know, I I don't believe any press releases I read. Like, you know, you don't actually have have to participate in in any of that. You can just say, no, thanks. I just, Uh Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry. I was going to say uh, <laughs> regarding press releases, have you seen, I, I've brought this up on the podcast multiple times, but have you seen the film The Square? Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Well, first of all, Ruben Oslin, the director, is just amazing. His film Force Majeure, like, just uh-huh. changed my life a bit. I've seen that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've seen that too. That's also Oh great. my yeah. God, he's so good. And like, yeah. Square is such a relevant. I mean, I think it was that was my favorite film that year. But Square is is such a relevant thing of just kind of like the, um, for lack of a better term, just like the bullshit that happens in the art world. But it's really about just like, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like human politics and and just social dynamics. You know, it's it's such a good, such a good film. But. Um, well, you know what, 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 what the, what the exile and absence thing is like with regard to what you're bringing up. You sure, know? sure. I mean, that, that is the shift from the public to the private. Yeah. You know, like there's a way in which like the conversation is really like um, fake and 
rehearsed and everything <laughs> like this when it happens on the public scale. Yeah. And you find, I'm sure you find this in your life, the conversations you have in private are much different than the stuff that you hear in public, you know, especially something like social media, yeah. but, you know, the internet in general, or, or you find that like an individual's way of thinking about the world and their place in it and all this stuff is far more nuanced and intelligent than anything that you're going to hear, you know, in the public sphere. And then people sort of willingly kind of dumb themselves down to sort of be, you know, belong somewhere in that, to find a tribe somewhere. Of course. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the catharsis of, I mean, why I continue to do this podcast, you know, it's the kind of thing that we were talking about the other day on the phone. It's like, kind of finding your people and not feeling like so lonely, you know, like you're lonely or yeah. alone in your thoughts, right. you know? And then like, so I don't know. I, I guess it's interesting because it sounds like the focus went from, you know, these sort of like external validations to more internal investigations almost. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I think the you know, the stuff that I'm talking about, you know, that I went through with all of this, I mean, is pretty harsh, you know, I mean, there were panic attack, panic attacks and ER visits, and not, you mm. know, like I was not, um, calm through everything that, that, you know, involved leaving LA and, um, you know, coming here and, you know, that feeling of alienation that I think you're bringing up and, yeah. you know, you're, you're sort of, instinct to do a podcast seems to me um to be aimed lifeward in a sense you're saying for sure i want to be i want to have a richer conversation of course know? of course and right so that makes sense um, regarding what you're talking about about the conversations and the nuance within your work right those conversations that you weren't able to have and people would more so, it sounds like, gloss over the surface, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I mean, the mistake that I made was to think that something that goes on in the art world is to do with something that goes on in art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think a lot of artists probably make that mistake <laughs> right <laughs> um, which is um, uh, very confusing but I, wa I want to right. go back into your project Nihil and specifically I pulled this quote by Arvo Pert and okay so let me read it to you so this was in Nihil part one, in case anyone wants to go to Josh's website and read this for themselves. But before one says something, perhaps it is better to say nothing. My music has emerged only after I have been silent for quite some time, literally silent. For me, silent means the nothing from which God created the world. Ideally, a silent pause is something sacred. If someone approaches silence with love, then this might give birth to music. A composer must often wait a long time for his music. This kind of sublime anticipation is exactly the kind of pause I value so greatly. And <laughs> that, that, that was like a confirmation of the, uh, of the end of that. <laughs> yeah. Really sorry about no, that. No, 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 no. It was, um, divine intervention. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it makes sense. I think, I think it's just this thing that we're talking about of, um, you know, perhaps you can, use meditation in this, in this way for introspection and silence. Um, but to really like sit with oneself. And I think that there's so many distractions that pull you away from being able to reach that higher part of yourself, you know, that soul connection. Right. And mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I just, I mean, I pulled that quote out. I mean, you know, obviously you put it in for a reason, but I just, you know, thought, thought that resonated with me so much and especially, you know, towards your, your work and your process. Well, Orville Parrott's music, uh, is so much to do with, uh, with how I came up with the structure for Nihil because all of his music is made with a really simple structure Mm -hmm. and, uh, so much of what carries what you know is ultimately minimalist music it's classified that way you know yeah. um is all the things he doesn't do so the silent places you know hmm. um and, and uh, sorry i'm kind of thinking about two things at once of here, course so I'm, no it's all good I'm trying to figure out which way i want to go but um you know what i remember when i put that quote in because of how much it means to me. And that this goes to like what we're talking about, the difference between the public and the private and Mm -hmm. the art world and the art and so on. Like, you know, I'm in a place now where I just absolutely do not give a shit. Like, you know, (laughs) if I say anything wrong or like if somebody, you know, it doesn't, I don't, I don't care. Like I, you know, and one thing of, you know, that word God is so loaded, you know, he, and Arvo Pear is a very religious composer. He's a very religious man, you know, He's a, an Orthodox Christian. And so his, his belief in God is quite literal and that he really, the whole structure of his music is, is metaphysical in the sense that it is actually, he wants to have a kind of sense of communion with God through that music and for the listener to have that too, Hmm. you know? And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not an Orthodox Christian or uh, I don't belong to any particular religion, but I gravitate toward religious language because I think um, it's so much at the heart of what compels us to make art, too. Like, I think art and religion were basically born together. Hmm. That's how I think of it, you know. And because I have this religious past, which I'm sure we've talked about before, Mm -hmm. I've talked about in other interviews and stuff like this. I mean, I'm um, attuned to it. So that like a word like God, like that, that's pretty easy for me to translate in a way that's meaningful to me in my own life without having to worry about or profess some kind of literal belief and Mm -hmm. whatever you want to say is or is not God, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, that's just a really wonderful place to be. Mm. Um, And so he he created a structure called um, Tintinabili which translates, uh, it has something to do with bells. So the, the sounds of bells, Mm -hmm. um, which I guess in his case would have something to do with church bells and, um, something to do with also the way that bells are arranged in the Orthodox church. Hmm. Um, and so there's this T voice and M voice, uh, that, interact in any piece of music of his and then he just basically creates the system almost mathematically before he starts so you can translate like these sounds into color for example you know and and make a painting that way that's layered in the same way that he might layer Mm. uh parts of the music or areas of the music Mm. um and so then it it's very strange in the way if, if the work becomes more more to do with its structure and less to do with like a theme or a concept or something like that. Um, then all this stuff is allowed to just sort of bubble up and come through that wasn't planned. And like hmm. sometimes some of the most effective passages in his music are also kind of discordant. So it goes, it has a sort of like dissonance and mm-hmm. that comes back in the, into something that feels sort of elegant Hmm. you know but the dissonance is has its own elegance somehow because it feels real it feels connected to life to an actual experience and and it's never really made glossy even though the music is beautiful so there's just so much in there you know that i could look to and use it as a starting place to figure out how to develop my own my own structure Hmm. which which you know it's called nihil now, hmm. which is also paradoxical because I mean, this means nothing, you know, and that's, that seems almost paradoxical to anything that Arvo Parrott would care about, like, because he is religious and he believes in God and, and meaning and all this, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. 
That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And so I guess what began that, I mean, if you can trace it back to like maybe a specific thing or, but you getting into these, I, I suppose, philosophies of Arvo Parrott or in terms of his music and how that relates to your, your art practice, um, like the genesis of it. Yeah. Like how did that begin? Yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious about that. Like, did it happen? <laughs> I mean, perhaps like we could say it happened from, well, actually, I don't know. Yeah. You tell me. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure that I'm clear either. <laughs> How did, how did it begin? Oh, um, I mean, we can just explore you know, it and it, see, it, see, what, see what comes, yeah. see, what bubbles up, yeah. see what bubbles up to the surface. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the, the first time I heard his music with his name attached to it, I realized that actually I'd heard it many times before. He's actually like really popular. Yeah. You know, you've heard his music in lots of movies. For sure. Lots. Oh no, I've def- you, you I've just, definitely heard, I've, I've listened to his music before. Yeah. 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 Um, so I realized I was familiar with it and probably, and I don't remember specifically, but probably I was just in a really opened place to be able to hear it, to really hear it, mm. you know? Wait, wait, let's, um, let's pause there. An open place yeah. to be able to hear it. Mm. Uh, I okay. think you have to break down to hear that music. <laughs> to, act, to actually <laughs> hear it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, uh, so I, th- I think it, um, it seemed to give a sense of beauty to that sense of absence I was talking about. Hmm. It seemed to make it have real presence in a way that wasn't threatening or feel like a minus, like an absence can be full. It's not necessarily a subtraction. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's also like relating to some of these abandoned buildings that you visit. I mean, you speak of like in your Nihil video, you were talking about how there's the paradox of absence, but then there's also a lot of noise at the same time regarding Mm. the writings on the walls and yes. um, And how there's also these, I think you said in the video something about how there's like these hopeful messages and then there's these like nihilistic messages and there's these like, um, just all sorts of, you know, it's like goes from hope to hopelessness all in one setting. And I mean, I guess since we're talking about that specifically, but I did want to ask if you remember any saying that stood out in one of these abandoned spaces that resonated with you. Oh, sayings. No, I don't, nothing that pithy or anything, but the, the thing that, um, that mm, mm-hmm. if we're talking about these abandoned spaces and the types of things you might find written on walls and floors and stuff like that, yeah. like, oh man, it is, it is sometimes really emotional and, and a little scary Yeah, because, um, like, Many times have I found, you know, somebody writing about like how they had wanted to kill themselves and eventually came out on the other side and and decided not to and are basically encouraging anyone reading it not to kill themselves. So mm. who's visiting these places? You mm. know, yeah, I've seen other I've seen other ones um, where I remember reading one where he says I was I was very close to doing a mass shooting. Wow. And basically through what he was writing about encouraging people not to do something like that. Wow. Uh, because like, you, you know, you think about like these spaces I'm going to, they're really out of the way. They're, uh, you know, they're not places most people would know about. I mean, you know, I walk and or drive on roads that aren't on maps, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so nobody has any reason to be in any of these places that have to do with their daily lives, really. I mean, they don't, they're not, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not on their way to work. It's not, uh, (laughs) it's not really like where you'd go for a hike exactly. You know, it's (laughs) not like that. Um, so 
yeah, they, these, so often, you know, they're abandoned churches too, or dilapidated churches, ruins of churches or whatever. And so that probably draws, you know, I think a lot of these people are religious, but I also know that not everyone in there is, I can tell by the way they're writing, you know? So, um, yeah, it's really important to them at that time Mm -hmm. to write that. I mean, they're coming into some kind of deep interface with their own mortality and, and death and what it means. And, you know, that basic question, like why stay? And, uh, that, I don't know that some art has a place there. Like Mm -hmm. there, there's a real utility in art with regard to questions like that. Hmm. In what, in what ways I'm curious, like, I'm curious what you think about that. Well, I like to say that the one religious belief that I have is the belief in consciousness. And I call that a religious belief because first, we don't really know what that means. But second, if we want to try to measure or describe it, it's mechanical. Hmm. So whatever uh, I'm calling consciousness is sort of just this wager that that it deserves its own word, you know, that it's special in some way. Hmm. So, uh, you know, I am saying that consciousness is in the air as it were, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, this isn't just to do with humans. This is to do with the the world, you know? And so um, I think art is, as an object, what would they, in the old days, they used to call it like the residue, didn't they? Like I'm thinking about the the kind of language that was around modern art and stuff like that. And, um, uh, I've never heard that actually. You know, what, 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 is that, what, yeah. does that, what does that entail? Oh, like a residue or a trace, you know, that there's something of, you know, what, what the artist, um, what comes into the artist's life that brings them to the place that they're making what they're, whatever they're making. Hmm. And then what that then kind of contains maybe in a dormant way. So, you know, I don't think too many people are going to say that like, uh, you know, a canvas with pigment on it is sentient or something like this, you know, (laughs) or, or is Uh, it? But (laughs) Well, yeah. In some, because (laughs) part of what I think consciousness is, is something which is co-emergent. It isn't innately there like matter, like a substance, you know, and that basically that residue, so to speak, is sort of in the work they're waiting and hmm, I like that. that the right person at the right time gets something and gives something to it. And that exchange that that is something transpersonal. And uh, I'll just call that consciousness. You know? I like that. So I yeah. think, mm-hmm. yeah. And um so I think that that is to do with the utility of the work. And I think this matters most when you're sort of in the vicinity of death. Hmm. I think it was like Rothko who said that the artist ought to have a preoccupation with death. <laughs> hmm. well, I, I guess he did. Hmm. Um, I like that. But yeah. Uh, yeah right. Well, I, I also liked how you wrote about the Access Mundi too. Which for mm-hmm. people that don't know what that is, it's a, a line or so, some sort of stem through the Earth's center, right? Connecting the surface to the underworld and the heavens. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, like any uh, culture or group around the world is going to have one. I mean, in a sense, there's only one, but in another sense, it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's kind of. Yeah. And what, I, yeah. And some, something that kind of came to mind too is when you said uh, when you said that residue. I mean, it makes sense because I mean, you know, we can draw that potentially to what you said about Arvo Parrot's work and how you're open at that specific time to be able to hear the influence, mm-hmm, and, right. and so we can connect that to the residue. But also when I was thinking of residue, I was thinking about molasses 
and I visually just saw that the because I think uh, yeah there's just like a stickiness I guess to like a type of work that really impacts you at a at a certain point in your life and it's like something that you just like cr- try to shake off but you can't get off you know yes yeah 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 then, right yeah and so I don't know that's just kind of a visual that came up <laughs> I just I just wanted to say that yeah. Well, I think that's right. You know, I think it is uh, something sticky you can't get off. You yeah, know? Uh, <laughs> you're you're right. That is know, molasses. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 and that's a great thing. You know, sometimes it can be antagonizing. Mm-hmm. You know, but you need to be antagonized. We need to be antagonized. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, and and, and those challenges along the way, they either. I mean, I think they show you who you are uh, and it's your decision to either lean in or to stray away, right? But the more that you stray away, I feel the less that you can actually attain a higher, uh, a, high, a connection with your higher self, I suppose. This is something that I've just been thinking about a lot recently, actually. Right. Yeah, and, and why? Why have you been thinking about it a lot? What are you reading, Yoshino? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been re- <laughs> I've been reading The Daemon by Anthony Peck, yes. and then I've been reading The Seed of the Soul by Gary Zukov. Um, okay, I haven't read either of those, but I'm familiar with The Daemon. Yeah, there's um, I, I just read this on like one. Of, do you mind? <laughs> I think I read this this quote, but I mean, just for the listeners out there, do you mind if I read a quote from uh, The Seed of the Soul? Please. Um, I think I read this to you actually the other day on the phone, but you know, please excuse my repetitiveness. Um, and you know, speaking of repetitiveness in general, I think uh, I don't know if you find yourself doing this, but I find myself repeating myself a lot, especially when something resonates with me. And in ways where I just generally forget, it's almost like uh, maybe it's something like this saying or this lesson or something is trying to make its way into my brain. So then I constantly repeat it to myself. Do you ever find yourself doing that? Yes. Right? (laughs) Like, like, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I, I feel like there's something... And, you know, since we're talking about books, let's just, you know, so like, uh, there's certain books that just resonate with me so much. And then I just, I, for the next six months or year or so, I'm just constantly repeating things from that, you know? And it's like, and it's not even really conscious. It's more of like a compulsion in a way. But those are probably the things that you need. Wouldn't you say? I mean, like you hear it said in a, because off, so often isn't it too that it's not necessarily an idea that you had never considered before. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like exactly. This. Yeah. But, but the way that it was said was perfect in terms of what and how you needed to hear it or read it at the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And now it's with you for life as a result. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's consciousness. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You know, there was, yeah. there was consciousness in the words that you wrote. Or that you read, mm-hmm. you know? yeah. It was it was passed on, and now you're passing. Yeah. On. Well, and now I shall pass it on. So. <laughs> all right, great. All right, we're all ready. We're all ready okay. all right. to grow a little bit. Hopefully, here. hopefully. <laughs> <sighs> well, I've been thinking about that concept too, about um, just growth in general, and I actually wrote something about. So before I, I. <laughs> Before I go into the, um, what's it called? Into, in, into this, this paragraph. So also in this book, Gary Zukov talks about the horizontal and the vertical path. Yes. And so the horizontal path, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory, but the horizontal path, you know, can be linked to like these external drives, such as like seeking money and power and wealth, right. Or material yes. wealth. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the vertical yeah. path is more so talking about spiritual growth and fulfillment and that sort of fulfillment and enlightenment. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, I think yeah, that horizontal and vertical thing I feel like is used 
a lot all over the for place. For sure. You know? For sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah, that's not his concept necessarily. But I've been also thinking about that a lot and perhaps that just pertains to what I've been going through. But um anyways. Yeah. Every action, thought, and feeling is motivated by an intention. And that intention is a cause that exists as one with an effect. If we participate in the cause, it is not possible for us not to participate in the effect. In this most profound way, we are held responsible for our every action, thought, and feeling, which is to say, for our every intention. And yes. Yeah. So I don't know. I just felt, I guess I just felt compelled to, to read that. I'm not trying to link it to it. I mean, it, it just links back into the conversation, but. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of like scanning through the pages. I, I've taken like tons of notes. <laughs> I was trying to find something else. But anyways, I'll just leave it with that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, in a way it's saying like our lives are not our own. You know, this is we're part of something larger than ourselves mm-hmm. and we're responsible for the, our participation in that, mm. you know. So yeah. I suppose one should uh, want to involve themselves in something which seems... um to transcend them. And to that end, I should think we might sort of use our imaginations to think about, you know, how does this work a hundred or 200 or 300 years from now? And, and Hmm. that's so much to do with how, like in my position, I might give up on the idea of relevance in a sense, because all of those sort of topical things that we're talking about, you know, in terms of like what kind of generates the conversation in the art world, like it's not going to be understood that way a mm-hmm. hundred years from now. Mm-hmm. It'll, and the way that we understand it now will seem silly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just not going to last it. You know, whatever brilliant idea you have is somebody's, you know, a hundred years from now is going to be, look at what these idiots thought. It's just, so that, it might, that's just how know, evolution <laughs> no, I mean, that's just like how, uh, yeah, that's just how evolution occurs, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't actually really know how. Evolution <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I say, I say, find it really mysterious. To be honest, yeah, perhaps I don't, I don't, I don't know either. I just, <laughs> I'm just saying words. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes words. Here comes words. Everyone, hold your. Yeah, but that is that is kind of how how I hear so so many things now. Is like here comes words, you know. Even when I'm writing, I'm like, oh, looks like you just wrote a bunch of words, guy. Well done. <laughs> um, and I think like the work has to be better than that, you know. Like it, mm. uh, yeah. But that you know that's why for me the structure became important because it just the, you know the structure itself is porous. So then all the things that come through feel like genuine revelations or discoveries you know I, I don't feel like i had something i wanted to talk about and now here's some words but in picture form you know it's just a process and then i learn more about how i see things and i become really surprised by that and it just seems like a way to get myself out of the way yeah and then mm-hmm. so whatever the work is about is not really something i'm in charge of anymore and so 100 years from now when somebody comes around and sees whatever they see in it, you know, it's, it's valid Mm. because, because it was never mine and it is theirs now. Mm. And, you know, that seems to me a conduit for consciousness. It seems like that's how consciousness ought to work. Like what, however things seem to me at the time shouldn't last forever Mm. and and it should be transformed by, you know, Mm -hmm. others better than myself, others, in a different position, mm. you know, can you, I mean, speaking about that surprise, but can you tell me about the last time you, you were surprised by some sort of revelatory, um, experience or just something that you just didn't expect to come up within your work or a thought or so on and so forth. Curious. Really just all the time. Yoshino. I mean, some might seem more major than others, but really, um, I think the reason why I am surprised as often as I am, like, I remember going through, and I still get this way sometimes, like I can get cynical, you know? I think we all can. Right. Right. 
but but in that mindset, in the cynical mindset, it seems as if you've seen everything before, you've heard everything before, and you're never surprised, and you can always see everything coming, you know, mm-hmm. and that that's a very defensive posture. It's a way of defending yourself against you know looking like a fool or um, being required to change your mind about the way you think about something, or you know. Um, hmm. But yeah. I think because I do that a lot less than I used to, then I am surprised a lot more often. And, you, you know, we could go on and on from a different bunch of different aspects of making the work. But I, I've been thinking lately mm-hmm. um, about how this idea to call this work nihil mm-hmm. and this philosophy nihil it, 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 you used the word nihilism earlier, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I actually, and I knew, I knew you would, I knew you would pick up on that, but anyways, continue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, if we can just suspend the idea of, yeah. um, binaries or dualities or, or something like this for a sure, second, sure. um, mm-hmm. nihilism isn't necessarily a bad thing. Like nihilism is just to say, there isn't sort of a presupposed set of meanings to the universe that that could be all that that means. And that, Mm -hmm. that doesn't need to be a bad thing, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So if, so if, if you're, if I'm going into this in a sort of nihilistic frame of mind, which is to say, I'm not supposing that the universe is meaningful. I'm not supposing that anything I do is meaningful or anything I have to say is meaningful. And I'm therefore not going to concern myself with the question of meaning. The kind of big surprise and irony to that attitude has been that by by getting rid of my own Mm -hmm. obsessions and preoccupations and so on, patterns emerge. Patterns emerge in the places that I visit, the things that I do, the things that I read, and then they emerge in the work itself when I'm making the work. Because there's a lot of kind of synchronicity that happens in the physical process of making the work and the layering and everything like this. You know, a layer that's underneath interacts with the layer on top in some way that I hadn't expected or or can't control. So, and anyway, Mm -hmm. these patterns emerge throughout this whole process. And it seems to me that like, what meaning really is, is pattern recognition. So once you recognize these patterns coming up, they start to take on this meaning. (laughs) And and because it wasn't premeditated or it wasn't forced or it wasn't, you know, sort of hammered down, it actually feels more meaningful than anything I was making before. (laughs) Mm. That's been such an incredible experience and revelation, something, you know, to learn. I suppose to some people that would just seem obvious or something, but to me, it wasn't obvious. I, I, I really have been genuinely surprised and delighted by how all of this has been mm. playing out. Well, I think it's, it's this, to me, it seems like this, um, acceptance of presentness and allowing yourself to let go of the expectation of finding meaning within something and, allowing it to reveal itself, which becomes a revelation Mm -hmm. through the presentness. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then your job then as an artist is to allow the mystery because it's, uh, if you want to start the, with the assumption that the universe is meaningless, but you keep recognizing these patterns, which seem meaningful, how do you know where that is coming from? Is that a projection on your part? These patterns come out because you're, predisposed to seeing things in this way well of course yes to some degree that's got to be true Mm. but then you know yeah Mm -hmm. but then still it begs the question why do you see the world in this way you know i mean there is something in the world and you're seeing it you know Mm. in the visible light spectrum and you know within the sort of language that you know how to interpret what you see but there is something there you know Mm. And so speaking of that, I mean, you know, when I was reading the passage of the archaic brother in Nihil, this idea of presence and how you being in the church at that time and how this image of 
a spirit, if you will, or potentially you were talking about um, how you felt your brother's presence at various points of your life. And you're not, I think you were saying something to the effect that you don't 100% believe in like, um, essentially like your brother's spirit following you around necessarily, but it, but you also don't discredit that, that that could be something that is occurring. Is that correct? Something, something that effect? Yeah. 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 Again, it's like just sort of allowing for the mystery without needing conclusions. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, but I, I value that experience though. Can you speak about that a bit? I'm, I'm curious, like your perspective on, on that. It's interesting. You ask me that now because, uh, I told you my brother, uh, my living brother is here visiting, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, he had just visited my grandma who has, uh, dementia, Mm. um, pretty recently. Mm. And, um, so anyway, he was telling me how, when he was just there, like, she can't remember people's names. Like she can't remember Daniel's name, like, but there's a picture of him like on her shelf, you know, and her caregivers and everybody are saying like that she talks to that picture all the time these days, you know? And he had a lot of other things to tell me about things she says and, Mm. and does and the way she's perceiving things. And, you know, he has this idea that she's kind of got like one foot in the living world and one foot in the other world. And, um, well, that's an, uh, an interesting idea. And it's interesting that she's of all that you have to understand. There are hundreds of photographs that she's got on these I shelves see. and all full of people she loves, you know, and this one picture is the one that she's looking at and talking to evidently. Um, wow. so that's, that's interesting. But, um, yeah, I mean, as far as, you know, what I'm calling the archaic brother that, that's part of the exile and absence tenet. And it's, it's something that I pay attention to because I think it matters in terms of consciousness, which matters to the work. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Mm. it, there have been many times often in meditation, but not necessarily in which, yes, I do have this feeling of his presence and, the more that I felt that the also the more I realized that I have actually always felt this presence since I was a little kid. And I'm even realizing that like a lot of stuff that I was drawing or writing from the time that I was a little kid was Hmm. to do with trying to find what seems to have been lost, you know, and I connect this to memory in general. Um, I connect it to lots of things. Mm. And I think there's something about that impulse that is important to the work. So this archaic brother, um, you know, like for example, when I'm sitting for meditation, uh, I, you know, I, I sit with my eyes open and I see all the same things I would normally see, but sort of what becomes prominent or recedes sort of changes, you know, there's a certain kind of throb to the surface of things. Mm -hmm. And, um, there have been times where I felt a certain kind of presence and I just call that the archaic brother, whether or not I want to directly attribute it to, you know, a visitation from his ghost or something like this. Hmm. Um, But what those two kinds of things have in common is that whether I'm thinking about him or whether I sort of come into this really affirmative relationship to absence through meditation that both have to do with one and the same. Hmm this trying to, this yearning, let's call it that, this yearning that is okay. It's an okay way in which to yearn. It is not something like a wishful thinking or um, sort of being overwhelmed with desire or something like this. It's um, it's something more subtle than that, but it, but it is powerful. Hmm. And so I I listen to that or I, I pay attention to that when it seems to appear and, you know, then, you know, wherever I am, I make a drawing. I mean, perhaps after the, after the session of of sitting or whatever, I just make a drawing of that area. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a sign. And then I, that drawing that I make, um, becomes my reference for a layer in the painting. So 
this is particularly true of my, you know, abstract or landscape paintings that um, they were layers on layers of these instances or these places in which I came into contact with what I call the archaic brother. So that really I'm just looking for them to have that same sort of presence, even though the individual places and the individual drawings of those places don't actually in the end show up at all on the surface. Hmm. Which is in keeping with the idea of absence, because mm -hmm. everything that got me to make this object, which is now a physical reality in the world, is all now absent through the manifestation of this object. Hmm. I'm curious, and I hope you don't mind me asking, but um, have you ever thought about, or what is, are, are you open to uh, seeing a medium? I'm open to anything. Yeah, that would be amazing. Hmm. Why? Do you know somebody? I just had a medium on the podcast. <laughs> you uh, Did you? I got to listen. Like right before this? Uh -huh. a Asia, Asia Dasher. She's like, uh, she's Justin's uh, wife and um, and she's a very well-known medium in her circle, I suppose, you know? Um, yeah, I'd be, uh, deeply curious and, uh, yeah, if, uh, you ever connect us, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious how open you are to that. But, um, well... Man, I mean, where to where to go from here? I feel like we went we went to a lot of places in this conversation. Um, yeah. Is there are, is there anything that you want people to know about just mm, things that you've been curious of, or things that have come up recently for you? Like generally around here is when I would ask for advice, but I think I'm going to leave that out and just, just, just things that have come up for you in, uh, in your observations and your writing something recent. I mean, always, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's a little bit too broad for me to respond to very easily. I mean, mm. like, I, I don't really feel like I have something that like I need to insist on being heard, mm -hmm. you know? Um, or just the first thing that pops up in your head or something that feels right. Mm. About, I mean... You know, okay, so like one thing that Maya and I have been talking mm -hmm. about a lot lately, because, you know, we have a two year old. Yeah. And, you know, we've been making art all this time, yeah. you know, which is something you really have to fight for. You know, we've been, we've built a life over the past few years and it's always full of constant adjustments and never, things never go exactly according to plan. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. But, you know, having a kid is the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, Have you always wanted to be a parent? It, uh, I think in a vague sense. Yeah, I think in a vague mm. sense, I just always thought, well, you know, eventually I'll be a dad. I see. But, but I, don't, I don't really recall spending a lot of time dreaming about it exactly. I see. Yeah. Just, just yeah. curious. You know, and I really, you know, I was 40 when she was born, I'm 42 now. Yeah. And I really exhausted every other sort of plan and scheme and idea and <laughs> everything that I thought would, would give my life some kind of meaning. And I think there was a lot of ego and the way that I imagined that all those years, mm -hmm. you know, I think I, I thought I would become a person at the point that, you know, people put me up on their shoulders and were celebrating my, my artistic genius, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then that, that, that would be meaning and that would be life and that, that, you know, and, um, uh, so because that hadn't happened, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
yeah. uh-huh. uh, I kept, you know, trying different ways to see if we could make that happen somehow. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just came to a point where it's like, well, look, this is, you're never going to be able to communicate the way you want to. Like you, you, this idea that you're going to be understood, like somehow this is like a 16 year old kid's idea. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Nobody understands yeah. me kind of a thing, you know? And um, you're not actually <laughs> participating in life, you know, yeah. you're, you're participating in actually something that's aimed in the opposite direction. It's going to kill you actually. If you, just keep banging your head against the same wall. And I mean that really literally like to, to be really blunt. And like I said, I don't give a shit what I say. Yeah. <laughs> like having a kid was like suicide prevention. I'm not even kidding. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and what a great strategy for that. Yeah. <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it, it worked. Um, and you know, that the reality of having a kid and being a dad is like, that's the, that's the foreground reality of my life. Yeah. I still have an identity about being an artist and I still love to make paintings and I love to write. And I, I love to venture out into the world and think about things and make drawings and all this, you know, but you know, what's so great is, uh, that the more that art, matters to you the more it sort of separates itself out from all the sort of like social and political machinations that all the chitter chatter kind of builds itself around and all the money sort of goes to yeah and um it what happens is like real life like and for me in this case having a kid and um living where we do and everything i I spend a lot of time in the natural environment i spend a lot of time in the mountains Mm. you know all of that stuff comes to the foreground and and becomes reality and thank god it does because it it's all real stuff like mila is a real little person hmm. and the mountains and, and and the trees and the boulders and the wildlife i encounter are all real things and the reality that existed for me before that were all abstract things they were you know n- narratives being replayed in my head over and over again they were like you know concepts and um models and systems and you know all this kind of thing and that so i was never really with reality i was with ideas about reality and those ideas were really warped because i think that's natural i think that's what we do when we spend all our time in abstraction (laughs) as we live in delusion essentially and not not in the sense that we're like making stuff up, but in the sense that we magnify certain things to reinforce a certain narrative or identity. And then we ignore or diminish other things in order to keep that identity going. And we, we think we're saving ourselves, but we're actually like killing any hope that we can be or make anything that would really be of any great lasting value. Yeah. And so what's great about that is that, you know, a painting is just a painting. I believe in art a lot you know, Mm -hmm. like, because I believe in consciousness, um, not because I believe in history and politics and that kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so the more that I care about art because it pertains to life itself, which is more important than the art, there's a real casual way in which I can go about it at this point, you know? I mean, like I have deep feeling toward it, but at the same time, like it is just a painting. Like I don't ever like worry that something is is going wrong or something. And so the hand, like with the surface of the, of the piece, it's really pretty non-analytical most of the time making a piece, you know, like one mark is just as good as another one color is just as good as another, Hmm. at least until, you know, later you come back and you, and you can see it in a certain way and you think, well, okay, maybe I'll go this way now, you Mm -hmm. know? But it, that, um, just that overall realization though, that like the more that life itself matters and the less that all the other abstract concerns matter, the more the work matters, but only because in these spaces you can say it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> It's like this imbrication of meaning and non-meaning of mattering and not matter. Of course. Yeah. It, yeah. And it seems like... I mean, at least from your writing, especially in uh, 
in your tenant for place, you're talking about meditation. It seems like meditation played a huge role into you realizing that reality is not about abstraction. Yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> but. Okay, go on. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Well, you know, when people talk about meditation, they talk about it in such a friendly way. So you kind of just think like, well, if I just <laughs> sit here in this room or I go out to this mountain and sit for a little while, then generally things will get better for me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, or like I'll feel better and, you know, you probably will feel better for, you know, an hour or two or something. But um, I actually became like, I would say like I became like addicted to it, you know, and in a way it, it became really serious. And it becoming serious actually um, ran me in the wrong direction for a short bit. Well, it sounds like you approach meditation like you would in the past with your art career. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, uh, that's right. Yeah. In a way, you're right about that. Mm. Um, but also, but oh, it, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, but also, I mean, I think meditation, like by being challenged or challenging yourself by sitting there with your feelings, your emotions, and allowing yourself to feel that presentness with yourself. And if those things come up, that can be perceived as negative at the time i think by you challenge yourself and dealing with it can actually lead to further healing oh right yeah i get your meaning but that wasn't actually the issue oh. it, it it was um <laughs> it was that it was that i couldn't integrate it with my life so the contrast of you know being in the mountains sitting on some you know kung fu-esque vista <laughs> you know just it just couldn't it, it you know, life didn't kind of measure up in a, in a certain sense. So there was that yeah. uh, on the one hand. And then there, I, I, some of these ideas I have, I don't really have a language for. And so it's a little strange to describe, but um, yeah. there was like, do you ever, cause you're in, you're interested in meditation as well, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Do you ever feel that you're able to split? Like, like, okay, you know, yeah, the, describe that the, the monkey, uh-huh. well, like the monkeys in the brain that, you know, you'll hear Buddhists describe or something yeah. like that, you know, mm-hmm. the monkey mind, like that'll be going on chitter, chatter, chitter, chatter. And then it can kind of sort of drift off, but you're still vaguely aware of it, but then you're more aware of this other kind of broader presence. So you're kind of in two different spaces of awareness at once. Mm. Like, does that ever... Have you ever experienced that? You know, something is telling me that I need to meditate more <laughs> because I, I have not, I have not, uh, that hasn't happened for me yet. Oh, oh God. It's, I'm not saying to, uh, to seek to achieve it. Well, I don't, I, I, I don't know what the feeling's like, so I'm curious. What it would feel yeah. Like, I guess. Right. Yeah. No, it feels good actually. I mean, because you're, you're not, you know, it's not that the monkey mind doesn't exist. You just don't feel threatened by it Mm. so that, and you realize you have a, there's a, there's a deeper identity than, Mm. you know, the ego. Well, I felt that way during psychedelics. (laughs) Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. That's a good way. Yeah. I mean, it immediately um, transports you to your, you know, uh, unconscious, I suppose, or many realms. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so like, let's, if we talk sort of vaguely about like the unconscious and the ego, for example, you know, like I, what I want to say is I think that I was making a lot of sort of like progress and having like a lot of growth and that kind of thing with regard to the unconscious, let's call it Mm -hmm. the, the, the deeper self, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And that, um, the ego was still quite unhealthy and, uh, that, what happened, uh, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, um, was that it, 
I got sent into a panic attack, mm-hmm. at, w- which um, was just one of the most awful feelings I felt in my life. Like I, you know, I could smell death, and I really thought I was going to die, and uh, all this kind of thing. And you know, that's went to the ER, and um, then that was followed by like three days of euphoria. So then I was worried like I was bipolar or something. Mm -hmm. And then that just sort of like leveled off. And then ever since then, I've been like, quote, normal, you know. But what that did for me was it seemed to expedite the other half or something. Like it seemed to be like almost like a baptism by fire or something Mm. like this, you know. Like like I couldn't... um, I, I just couldn't be done in any way. I mean, I kind of took it as like a gift in the end. You yeah, know? that sounds like that. And I just, yeah. I haven't returned to that same kind of like malicious inner voice since. Hmm. Why did I bring this up, Yoshino? I don't know, man. We're going, we're going, we're going, we're going in these directions. I don't know, man. Like, I, I don't know, but I think it's beautiful, you know, to be able to speak about this and this, you know, I, I kind of have a problem with this idea of transcendence because I think the, you know, the more that yes, I, <laughs> the more that I think about it, or well, I mean, the more I think about it, the more that I read as well, it's, you know, these processes are cyclical, right? So it's like you transcend uh-huh. and you go back in the underworld and you transcend and that, you know, and it's like, but yeah, well, I think the worst mistake you can make is just to think, well, I'm all better now. I'll never have to worry about anything <laughs> yeah, in my yeah, life yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Well, we're, we're cured. Yeah. 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 But I think there are certain th- I I do think growth is possible and there are certain things that we can overcome. But I, I don't believe in transcendence in the sense that, like, you know, you really stop being, you know, a body here on <laughs> Earth. Like, you're, you're, you're here with the rest of us in the muck and all that. You know, I mean, you're not, I, you know, I, I, very yeah. reluctant about you know gurus yeah no i about, i agree, I agree with reason. you i think we're on the same page there yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. right yeah. yeah well well thanks thanks for doing this man thanks for um exploring and sharing your thoughts and yeah and no, i appreciate you for uh for doing this it sounds like you're in a good place yeah i think so creatively and i, I you know Maya and I talk about this too. It's like there, there's never a day that goes by at this point in my life where I'm not just incredibly grateful. That's great for the life I have, the people I have in my life, and where I live. It's, it's really, it's really good. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'll definitely have to come visit sometime. Go for a run. You are always invited. It's just <laughs> all we need is about two hours' notice. <laughs> <laughs> two hours notice wow yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> well, well, enough time to clean the yeah. enough time to clean the toilets oh yeah <laughs> well it'll take me more than two hours to get there so <laughs> <laughs> good because oh. good, we've got three toilets oh nice cool yeah <laughs> <laughs> well cool well th- thanks yeah thanks for doing this and um yeah anytime you want to come on share your thoughts we're welcome to All right. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you, Yoshino. We will talk again in private sometime soon. Of course. I'd love that. tuning in and see you next time.